Hey, what's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. First of all, I want to take that time and thank everyone that watches this every single week or checks out that audio version of this show on the Simple Man's Comics podcast. Once again, that's available on iTunes, it's available on Google Play, Stitcher, pretty much where podcasts are found. But we got a great list this week. We're talking about that Bolo list, be on the lookout list. We're talking the first appearances, We're talking about Reader Buzz, Variant Buzz. And we are talking about Jack's long-term play. A lot of people were hunting one specific book this week. There were some great books on this list, huh, Jack? Yeah, uh, you know, it would be really easy, Brian, this week to say that this is a one-trick pony week. Um, there's obviously one book that brought the masses out to the comic shops. Again, um, it's Batman 89 all over again, plus some. But uh, there are some sneaky books on this list, Brian, um, kind of representative of all categories. So it'll be interesting to talk about them. Yes, but before we get into the list, last week we did announce that we were giving away two sets of Mad Cave books. We're going to give away a trade paperback for Honor and Curse number one, volume one, I'm sorry. We're going to give a trade paperback for Knights of the Golden Sun, volume one, as well as that CBSI van that we helped work on, Honor and Curse number one as well. Right, Jack? Yes. And of course, now we put all those uh, comments, great comments, great feedback from you guys. Uh, we, again, we were looking for your kind of take on what is the representation of Mad Cave Studios products to you in your area? Um, what is uh, your experience with Mad Cave? Are you reading their titles? Are their titles available to you? And uh, we took all those comments, a lot of excellent comments, threw them in that random dot org organizer, drew a couple names, um, and congratulations to Brian Criswell and Wolf Warner. Shout out to you two fellas. Uh, congratulations on winning these excellent trades and variant uh, and kind of stepping into the Mad Cave Studios universe. Um, be sure to email us at simplemanscomics at gmail.com and we will be sure to get the details from you so we can get those out to you but brian um here's the thing all those comments that everybody shared with their experience with mad cave somebody was paying attention weren't they yeah actually someone definitely was so i got a message from mark london who is the ceo of mad cave studios and he was at comics pro this weekend and he hit me up and said hey um, really appreciate you. Well, I was like, hey, I appreciate you giving us those trades to give out to our viewers. He said, yeah, I liked all the comments. He's like, I noticed that Mad Cave isn't in a lot of places and we are working on rectifying that. And one of the things that came out of Comics Pro this weekend was that Mad Cave Champions program, right, Jack? Yeah. And, you know, I love unique retail programs and programs that are really aimed to make comics more accessible. So shout out to Mad Cave Studios and their brand new editor in chief. Chris Sanchez, a friend of the channel, um, for all that they've got going on. Right. So that Mad Cave Champions program, that's going to give some guarantees to retailers to help carry the books in the stores and help get those copies in the hands of the readers. You know, there's no hiding it. We've talked about it. We've championed it ourselves. We're big fans of Mad Cave. But either way, hopefully those that are looking for some of those Mad Cave titles will get some soon. And like we always say, if you can't find them at your LCS, make sure you check out madcavestudios.com. They sell a lot on there as well. But with that being said, we're getting right into the bolo list, starting with those first appearances. And first up on the first appearance list is the book that everyone was talking about this week. And we're talking about Hell Arisen number three, Jack. Yeah, now we usually have a policy on this show with this list. We try not to list first appearances twice, right? We don't want to avoid this whole cameo, first full appearance argument. But there is no denying punchline. There is no avoiding this character. There is no avoiding talking about this character. And I would have been remiss to not highlight both books in a first appearance section because it is, in fact, that first appearance that is driving the secondary market sales. And Brian, these secondary market sales, they are there, they are real, they are strong, and they are, dare I say, insane. $45 right now for cover A. We're looking at sets of cover A and B go for as high as $90. We're seeing sets of Batman 89 and Hell Arisen 3 selling for a combined about $80. The demand is there. Yes, copies are flowing onto eBay, but copies are also flowing off of eBay. Not only that, this show is driven based on social media, right? What is being talked about on social media? 
Well, it has been almost hard to put together a list the last few weeks because the overabundance of posts that we're seeing really driven towards this character punchline. Um, Brian, you mentioned before the show, and I don't mean to call you out that you're almost sick of punchline. And I get that, right? We've been in this a long time. Um, almost. It, you know, it's not it's almost a, right. It's a, it can be a jaded thing. I, for me, um, yeah, I, I totally get how you feel that way because it's like, almost like, how do I get on the mic and talk about this when I've talked about it a few other times and what's unique about it? I, I assume most of you by now know who punchline is, what her validity as a character is. I've got my DC, uh, feminine superheroes hat on right now because, uh, the reality is punchline is telling Supergirl, Wonder Woman, all of them to make way. It's really crazy to look at what her prices are going for. And when you try to do comparables, which I've tried to do on the show before, um, it, it really kind of lacks. I've heard people say things like, I'd rather buy Jason Todd's first appearance. Um, you know, I'd rather buy Damian Wayne's first appearance. Because these are all first appearances that are competitively priced compared to where we're sitting right now with Punchline. Um, it's it's insanity. We've seen crazy things like sealed cases of 160 punchline, uh, Pellerism number three, uh, first punchline um, being put on eBay for $20,000. Now, that's obviously not going to sell for that, um, but it's going to drive attention. So uh, this isn't going anywhere. And I really, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And we've got a marketing... Um, kind of a disaster situation on our hands as DC rushes to capitalize and they move up that great Stanley Archer and Lau, uh, Batman 94, cover B variant, up to number 92. If they switch it with the Matina one, uh, I think orders are going to be enormous for this at this point. But I still think there's going to be a demand there for this. But DC is definitely going to ride this punch wave as hard as they can. Uh, I only wish they would capitalize on these second prints like we've talked about, because it doesn't look like they're going to do that. I saw some images for some red covers. <laughs> you said that name like the man wasn't like a, like a parent does to the kid when they're in trouble. He said, we got that Stanley Archer Mlau. Stanley Archer Mlau. <laughs> but you got the yeah, foot um, That's just a, chaos man i don't know how many pre-orders or any of that's been done for 94 92 um i know our channel sponsor frankie's is anyone that ordered 94 he's going to give them 92 because that's what they wanted the order for right um but he's going to also offer them if they still want 94 to let him know and and he'll keep them with an order of 94 also I'm kind of saying that wrong but basically he figured people wanted that art germ cover so he's moving those orders over to 92 for it but so kudos to him. I did pick this up today for cover price at my uh, LCS Third Eye Comics, the smaller one down here in Southern Maryland. But I read it. I didn't. I liked Batman. I like the Batman '89 story a lot better than I like this issue. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to take that issue. It's not going out in February's Bolo boxes because we already got those packed up and then just sent them out. But I'm going to put that Hell Arisen number three in one of the march bolo boxes there you go that out to someone it's randomly packed i don't i always just pack them randomly and slap mail labels on them and ship them out so i don't know who's gonna get it but i'm letting one of the patreon members who's a premium bolo subscriber they're gonna get a hell is a number three on top of the frankie's variants and everything else we put in there yeah which is so awesome um and again that's a, just one of the great things one another reason to get on those uh bolo box subscriptions but this this is gonna really brian bring up so many topics like you brought up the reader buzz which has been kind of overlooked in the whole process but um also you sent me a message you know we we have a new podcast right the simple men's and friends uh podcast right here on the simple men's comics youtube channel and we're kind of talking about the topics of the day and Brian, you messaged me earlier and talked about markups, stores marking up uh, prices. We saw a lot of that with this book. And, uh, you know, I expressed my opinion. Again, I come from a perspective of, uh, you know, I went to college for retail management. I've been a retail manager for about 20 years. That's where my, my perspective comes from how I was taught. It seems to differ from person to person. Some people get upset when I, you know, I say, I don't, I don't think people should play the first market and the second market. But um, th that topic is being talked about. The other topic is when do you sell, 
right? That's always a question we get is, should I sell? People have asked me, well, I'll full when disclosure. you can make a profit. Right, full disclosure, I'm selling right now. Could, may I get burnt on this? Sure, sure, this could be a $150 book. But the question becomes, am I gonna be upset about it? No, because the ROI you're pulling on this book is insane for a modern comic. I'm very happy to take that money and be able to make a, a long-term play uh, with that. But that's me. Uh, you know, if you're going to second guess yourself later, then you may want to hold something back. But, you know, we're starting to get that question a lot. And the truth is you got to answer that. It depends on what's going to make you happy. Yeah. And I haven't really been selling much. In fact, I was joking around about it because when I yeah. got it and people were saying on the Patreon discord about how they go into like three different shops and didn't have it, or they were marked up or they were held for full boxes, which is another reason for to have a pool box, but not a lot of people like I have a pool box, but how many people are putting near the villain hell arisen on a pool before prior to the news of this coming out. But so I was joking in the discord chat going, you know what? I'm going to wait and I'm going to put it on eBay and I'm going to undercut the crap out of everyone with it. <laughs> so now I'm going to throw in a bolo box because I was joking, but it is going in the bolo box for real and moving on through the first appearances. We've kind of beat that horse. But uh, next one up is 2020 Force Works number one. This is your favorite first appearance, right? Like <laughs> team first appearance. Right. And one I literally referenced the other day, uh, speaking of the podcast, when we discussed the fact that a lot of these properties get done simply for the fact that they're trying to maintain a, um, a, a license and, and a copyright on a character. And I think uh, I had read that Force Works was in that sort of a situation. We're coming up on something like 20 years since their last publication or something like that. And they needed to put something out. It, it does fit in with the 2020 Iron Man kind of initiative. I don't know too many people who are kind of hype on that. It's missed me a bit. And that may be kind of, again, my perspective. So you know, no shade on those who are really digging that storyline, but it wasn't something that really resonated with me. The only thing I ever took part in it was that Machine Man 2 flip. I'll do that all day, but, the, uh, you know, all of this stuff, uh, you know, it hasn't really been, ha hasn't been my, my sort of thing. And yeah, we've talked about team appearances. This is not like an organically built team of new characters. This is people thrown together to create a team, which doesn't really ever seem to pan out. Rare occasions it can but really doesn't ever seem to. Right. Then the next one we're going to talk about for first appearances is Ant-Man number two. This is what? Macrothrax? Yeah. Cool looking character. Um, Ant-Man has come. There were some cameos in the first issue that you could say are first fulls. In this one, there's like three or four others. Uh, you can, I'll save that debate for you guys. You guys can decide. I don't know if anyone really cares about Ant-Man number one or two, but that's kind of my point is that these books are completely under the radar and Ant-Man doesn't have this huge world. I love Paul Rudd as Ant-Man. I'm excited to see like the age progression that they were able to do in Endgame with his daughter to be able to kind of get some of that Scott Lang, Cassie Lang stuff. Um, I think that these characters may have legs more than others, but we're talking about shot in the dark books. We're still talking about books you buy for cover price, you throw in your box. Or what I like to do, make a note of them. Make a note, use your app, use whatever tool you want to use, coverprice.com, use that checklist. Um, make sure that you're noting these books and then pay attention a little later when you're going through those 50% off sales, 75% off sales, dollar bins, whatever. And, you know, those first two issues of this Ant-Man run have been filled with first appearances. Right. The next one's coming just in time for an upcoming Disney Plus show, right? And we got Falcon and Winter Soldier number one out this week with the first appearance of The Natural. Yeah. Like, you know, it seems like a kind of a cool assassin type. You don't know whether, like, this I is one that, Robert Redford at first. Yeah. You know, this is one that kind of my antenna goes up because the character in and of himself doesn't really seem like, well, that's not something I'm going to see them adapt in the Winter Soldier show or the Winter Soldier falcon show but at the same point i feel like they're only doing this comic because of the show and maybe it's not a season one thing maybe it's down the road maybe i'm overthinking this all together and this is what happens when you have six seven first appearances every week uh this is kind of 2019 to me was the year of first appearances 2020 is going to put that to shame right then the last one for first appearances this week is tarot number three with first appearance of unbelievables and this is like a cartoon Avenger team, like animal team. This is just a silly thing. Um, this isn't something 
that I would sit there. I, I haven't read the tarot series. This looks funny. It looks cute. It doesn't. It, but uh, there, the tarot series has put out some like some really cool variant covers. But um, yeah, this isn't something like take serious for you investors or anything out there. But if you're reading tarot, let me know. I really have no idea what that mini series is about. What's going on? So if you're reading it and it's cool, let us know. We, we you know, that's kind of missed. I think both of us. Right. So that's going to wrap up first appearance section this week, and we're going to move right on into that reader buzz. <laughs> First one coming up on that reader buzz is a brand new book from Vault this week, and it was Finger Guns number one. I was actually able to read this story. And I'm enjoying this for the first issue. I'm definitely on board, at least through that first arc. Yeah, I like the first issue as well. Um, it moved quickly, and I, uh, you know, I kind of, I can go either way with that. It depends on the book. Sometimes I like kind of like the setup. Um, and sometimes I like when you kind of jump into the story, but the, this one, you definitely, you're jumping right in, um, with vault, you kind of know what you're getting at this point. I feel like even a vault book that I don't love, I don't totally dislike. I've enjoyed most of what they put out. It's, I feel that way about, you know, like mad cave and, and boom for the last year. Uh, really like the bar just keeps getting raised. But this is like a crazy kind of concept for a book to uh, to try to take. But th that's what I've liked is these kind of like out of the box books. Um, the Vault Vintage variant. That's a uh, that's an homage to I think like a Fiona Staples cover possibly. I'm not. I was gonna say I couldn't. I yeah, I'm not. It was because it was it was Tim Daniels, but right. I'm not real familiar with it. And that's the thing is, um, these Vault Vintage variants have gotten more creative i'll say but more outside the like norm of kind of mainstream but it was great when we talked to them about how they go about um producing these variants it's very different than how maybe you and i would because they're looking for something that's cool you and i would be uh what can we sell what what is what is going to be marketable and uh they're out there um kind of making some never before seen homage books yeah so let us know in the comments did you guys pick up finger guns what did you think of it did you like it are you on board or did they not have it at your lcs but either way i enjoyed it and like i said i'm looking forward to that next issue but we're gonna move right on into the next reader buzz book and we're talking about head and society number one yeah dark horse comics this one's kind of cool looking Raphael albuquerque um there was a uh, Scalera variant cover B that seems to be selling out at a lot of places. Um, again, I'm not a huge Dark Horse fan. I, it's not, it's never been consistently my favorite publisher. Um, of all the stuff that I've seen recently, and I've been trying, as I've noted, to pay more attention because that Netflix first look deal is undeniable. I mean, there's value there. I like this book. I also like Raphael Albuquerque. I think he's kind of underrated. He's a consistent guy. And you have these guys who kind of like, they're always might not be a 350 hitter, but he's hitting, you know, 280 every season. You can count on him. Um, I know I'm getting super baseball nerd on you there, but I, I really like Rafael Albuquerque. And I think that um, this is a, I guess a creative team. They've worked together before. So this is one of the first kind of, it's got a cartoony look a bit, but uh, again, and with Netflix and what they're doing with animation and some of the anime stuff, um, that doesn't necessarily turn me off the way it would have, say, four or five years ago. Four or five years ago, I would have probably looked in another direction. Um, but, you know, I've always said you have to kind of, like, note the Dark Horse books because of the Netflix deal. This is one of the first ones I think that I was more like, okay, I, I, I think this one I feel good about. Right, and they had Bang last week, right? Yeah, yeah, and that, I, that has been incredible success, and we've heard option rumors on that already. But, again, we've heard option rumors on that, and theoretically, if it got optioned anywhere but Netflix, Netflix would have to turn it down. And speaking of Bang, this week we had Bang number one, the second print come out, right, Jack? Right, and there wasn't even like advanced cover art solicited for this. People didn't really care. Uh, they were grabbing this one, whether it was just going to be a recolor or a unique cover. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not even sure what they ended up doing with it. Um, I was told early on uh, from Larry Doherty from Larry's Comics up in Massachusetts, shout out Larry Doherty, that Dark Horse kind of mails in their late printings and they can kind of uh, overproduce them at times. 
Uh, and, you know, he would have more experience in that than I would. It, like I said, Dark Horse isn't, isn't a lane I feel like supremely comfortable. But I will say I did pre-order a few bang number one second prints because this book seems like it's got a rocket on it. Yeah, and Brian, this hit the list, and we didn't even have cover art for this uh, in advance uh, until recently. Um, and this is one of those books where it, this is on the list because of the success of that first print. That first print did extremely well with both readers and collectors. It's a lot of speculation going around on this one with this one, like we mentioned before, getting option, and that's caused people to pay attention to these uh, later printings. Now, I, I talked with uh, Larry Doherty, Boston, Massachusetts area comic dealer, kind of a comics legend in the game from Larry's Comics about this and about Dark Horse and how they handle late printings. And in the past, they've kind of been kind of lazy with cover uh, art changes. So it is cool to see them come with a unique cover, um, but they've also got a reputation for overprinting. So it'll be interesting to see if that's the case here or if this will um, have any sort of legs. But full disclosure, I only grabbed a few copies of Bang Number One, the first print. So I did go grab a few copies of the second print. It's one of those buy and hold books for me. It, it may not be anything, uh, but it's it's one of the most momentum uh, filled books I've seen Dark Horse have in some time. Uh, and there's a you know obviously when you get the endorsement from uh, Keanu Reeves. Uh, you know, seems like Matt Kent stars. Yeah, they made sure they kept that on the on the second print. Back. Absolutely, Matt Kent stars seemingly rising, and I, I've been on record on the channel about how I think Matt Kent is as a writer. So I like the first issue. I have high hopes for the series. You don't know where it's going to go, but um, you know, I'm not surprised to see collectors picking up these second prints. They seem to be selling out in a lot of places. Next one up on Variant Buzz is Avengers Wasteland number two. This is that one in twenty five variant. Yeah, um, we saw some some strong pre-order sales from a few uh, Marvel incentive variants. Um, this Avengers Wasteland number two is kind of a, a a prime example. It sold out at major retailers pre-order. Um, we started I have a quick question. Sorry, yeah. I didn't, but um, but outside of exclusives, even if exclusives, has Ricardo Federici done many Marvel books? And no, and that's where I was get, okay. going with it. Now, I think, and we've said this before when we talk about DC cover bees, um, I think that, and this is kind of my theory, I could be wrong, I think that's why this book is doing well. I think the book is doing well because of a reaction to the cover art, and I, to my knowledge, he hasn't done um, any Marvel covers, and there are several artists who have kind of cut their teeth doing DC cover bees, who have done consistent, successful, um, stunning DC cover bees who, if they were incentive variants and they were drying up in the market and being chased by collectors, uh, because of course the incentives are in vogue well over the, the, you know, the regular price cover bees, which tend to have a higher print run. Um, I think a lot of these artists would start to get a name. So it'll be interesting to see. I don't know what the state of his contract situation is. He like over on Marvel now, um, but if we start seeing more of his incentive variants, I could see him starting to gain a following and a popularity similar to the way uh, Lucio Perillo did. Spider-Ham, this is also a 1 in 25 from David Nakayama, right? Yeah, you know, I love David Nakayama, not just because he's like, a, you know, he's been a good dude uh, for us and he's, a, you know, he's liked and shared and, and commented on stuff um, that we've posted in the past on social media, but uh, Consistent artist, man, underrated. Just one of those guys who just puts out good stuff. Kind of like how I was talking about Raphael Albuquerque. Um, but every now and again, he puts out a book and it, it pops. This isn't necessarily popping, though, I think, for the artwork's sake. It's just kind of a cool, funny cover. And it's one of those things where who's ordering 25 copies of spider Hand at this point? But there is still like a, like a fan base there. There is still a fan base between Spider-Verse and the fact that Peter Porker always had that kind of like undercover fan base um getting to know jason latour He's like the cooler scrappy do yeah and getting to know like for instance jason latour the creator of spider gwen writer of southern bastards in covering kind of his work his appearances at comic uh conventions in the area panels in store signings etc and getting to kind of talk to him it always struck me as kind of funny that 
the character that he would have said, you know, dream project for Marvel would have been a spider ham ongoing. So when he got to do the annual, he was extremely excited for that. So there is a fan base for this character. And I think that the into the spider verse movies have only kind of increased that because if you obviously, if you've seen that movie and if you, especially if you've seen that movie with children, spider ham is really uh, not just a scene stealer, but almost a, a film stealer where that's kind of one of the major takeaways that kids walk away from that movie with. So, It'll really be interesting um, if this variant is just a short-term flash in the pan, you know, over re uh, ratio type book, or if there's any long-term legs here as a book like this dries up. It, I could see this being like some of those releases from 2014 and 2015, where you started to see, you know, like a lot of these B characters like Nova, She-Hulk. Uh, at the time, don't kill me people, but at the time it was the case, Moon Knight and Morbius, um, and some of those incentives became just ghost because they just, you know, who was ordering 25 copies, issues three, issue four, issue five, et cetera. All right. And then the next one is star number two. This is another one in 25 variant, which I could see this being popular because is, are people reading star? You know, the funny thing is that was my reaction, but people seem to like the first issue. That was the general reaction I heard. I, you know, I, I will check it out at some point. I've kind of gotten off Captain Marvel. I need to kind of get back, um, pick up on the last couple of issues and pick up on Star. The cover art for this is cool. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, uh, Fagan, Fagan. I don't know how you pronounce his name. Uh, you can get in trouble with that last name. But, you know, that I like his cover art. I've seen a couple of his pieces before. Um, and by the way, I'm totally assuming that it, it's a his, it's a he. So don't shoot me if I'm that far off. But uh, I, I really like kind of like that portrait painted style. I think it's a great looking cover. Um, and, you know, it's another one where I just think that some of these variants, as well as they were doing this week, they, they really were doing well, not for the name behind the artist, but for how really high quality the art was. I just think it's tough when you're coming out the week of punchline, man. People's attention is only going to be on one place. Right. And this next one, one of my favorite artists, especially when he's drawing Batman and Joker. But we are talking about Detective Comics number 1020. This is that cover B, Lee Bermejo. And it's a gorgeous cover, in my opinion. Right, immaculate. And that's, we're not talking about a secondary market book here. This is just a book. Um, Probably wouldn't have made the list on most weeks. Like I said, this was a more of a struggle week because so many punchline posts. Um, but this is, if you love anything that Bermejo does with the black labeled type stuff, this is a great regular DC cover B with Detective Comics. Um, you know, I, Bermejo to me is and, uh, as consistently amazing with his, his Gotham related stuff. I just his dark kind of gothic painted style is made for Gotham City. Yeah, and I love like the absolute Luther, the absolute Joker. Yes. But he's, I agree, definitely in his element drawing Gotham. And he, he was doing Daredevil for a while too, so. Yep. Very similar. Yeah, and, and God forbid, but may end up kind of cross-mixing in the future. <laughs> yeah, Darebat. <laughs> 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 moving on it's been one of those days next one we're talking about this is a great cover as well we're talking about that avengers number 31 this is the j scott camel cover i've kind of like been fatigued with j scott camel but i always think he's in his element when he's drawing either uh, mary jane or gwen stacy and this is that gwen stacy variant for it i'm so glad you said that too because you and I have kind of like really been in sync about how we feel about variant cover artists. And I think it's because it's not unique to you and I, I think that's kind of how the market feels. Um, and recently I started to notice a clamoring for J Scott again. And I, th I really attributed it largely to the newer collectors. Again, you and I are two dusty veterans. Uh, you know, we've seen guys eight, nine years ago, putting their J Scott Campbell master collections together we've seen amazing J. Scott Campbell collection. And a lot of people are just getting started now. But I say all of that to say that I've been paying attention to the last few covers that J. Scott has put out. And I have to say that I think the recent J. Scott Campbell stuff is really trending upward. 
think the quality's there. You mentioned this is a great cover. And I agree with you, the Gwen Stacy stuff, he's in his element. But have you seen that Catwoman? Um, like the uh, 80th anniversary variant? Like, that's incredible. By the way, I know this is totally off topic. That entire Catwoman uh, 80th anniversary set with Delato and G. Young Lee yeah. and, and Jim Lee, and uh, it's just insane. Um, absolutely insane curation of cover artists. But yeah, I, with that book, with this one, um, there was a, a one a couple of weeks ago that Jay Scott had that made the list. Um, we're starting to see that again, where people are starting to get to a point where when he puts out a book, um, they have to grab it. And that fatigue is real. I, we've almost titled it Art Germ Fatigue, but it's really artist fatigue. Like you, people just get worn out on an artist. And you almost have to pull away before they start kind of getting, getting that interest back. And I, I'm interested to see what some of these kind of like next releases from J Scott kind of are able to do. If that will again, increase that um, similar to what, like same with Adam Hughes, Adam Hughes was everywhere. And now suddenly you don't see Adam Hughes as much. So I expect to see Adam Hughes have some success uh, again, be on the lookout. Our, it's one of our channel sponsors, frankiescomics.com. We've got that amazing Adam Hughes Spider-Woman variant on the site. Yeah, and that just went live on their site tonight, right at 9 p.m. So you can head over to frankiescomics.com. Open up another browser while you're watching this, though, and then go over there and get that Adam Hughes Catwoman goodness. Yeah, and that's actually a pretty cool deal that Frankie's Comics is doing right here. Um, they, it's it's actually a project through Adam Hughes's own website. So the, he is facilitating these for Adam Hughes. So something real cool, hopefully the start of a new relationship. Again, congratulations to Kevin from Frankie's Comics. Uh, you know, always got that new cutting edge stuff and bringing that ah.com stuff to Frankie's Comics is pretty cool. Then we're going to go into that last one on the variant buzz list. And we're talking about Ravencroft. Number two, another one in 25, and this is that Scon variant. Right, and Ravencroft stuff has been popular with readers. Um, the variants have been popular with variant collectors. Uh, Scon, we've seen kind of his star rise, really rising from the retailer exclusive variants. Yeah. Where and totally awesome Hulk covers. Yeah, and, and then DC Comics and cover Bs, consistent cover Bs. Um, so Scon is another one where I feel like any cover he does could potentially be a real popular cover. Um, and, you know, this is another one where, you know, they're all kind of hovering at or uh, slightly above ratio. Nothing's like taking off. Again, I think that's largely due to Punchline. I think if Punchline doesn't exist, one of these variants, probably not Spider-Ham, probably this one or the Avengers Wasteland skyrockets. Yeah, so that's going to wrap up the variant buzz. And now it's time for Jack's long-term play. So I think a book that was kind of hidden in a bunch of the buzz about some other books, especially Hell Arisen number three, but a book that came out this week was Jenica number one. And this is Jack is your long-term play this week. Yeah, and again, guys, full disclosure, Hell Arisen number three is like the book of the week, right? It's the book, that the banner book to pay attention to. But that's not the point of this segment. That's not the point of this portion of the list. The portion of the list is supposed to be dedicated to a book that really, if you look at it in and of itself, you pre-ordered it three months ago. It may not look like a great investment today, but we're looking long term. So the book I want to talk about is TMNT. Jenica number one. Now, of course, you know, I'm a big proponent of Jenica Turtle. Uh, I was on board day one with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 95. Um, a big advocate of the character long term. Got to be cautious. Seems like everyone's all in. We're still missing those Jenica toys. We're still missing that Jenica merchandise outside of the comics world. But that's really the only thing we're missing from this becoming really part of the permanent turtle lexicon. And uh, coming out with this one shot, I think is big. If you go back in the history, hit those back issue bins. If you're not familiar with turtle books, you may not be aware of this. Now, my hardcore turtle people, shout out to Paul Wiederhold from uh, the Tales from the Flipside podcast. He knows what I'm talking about. Those micro series, those one shots, those origin books are really tough finds at this point. And I'm talking about cover A and cover B. Forget about those incentives. That becomes even tougher. Um, and these incentives, I think, 
for this book, I think are going to have legs long term. The 125 variant. Now, Brian, we've talked ad nauseum at this point several times about the value of IDW with these 125 incentives. They just don't do them very often. And I had doubts about this one because there's about eight store exclusives. And shout out to the stores who did store exclusives because this is a book I would have for sure wanted to have my hands on an exclusive for two reasons. Number one, because I think it's going to be a big issue long term. Obviously, it's the long term play. Um, and secondly, I think that these incentives are going to have legs. So, you know, even at a 1 in 25 incentive, if a store did um, a thousand print run, you know, uh, of this book, you're still looking at a fat stack of incentives sitting on those retailers' desks. So I would have expected this incentive to really be selling slowly, but we're still seeing sales of 30 to $35. Now that is outperforming some of the Marvel books that we've already discussed that had immense variant buzz. So I think people really are underestimating Jenica Turtle, Brian. I think a, a large part of say like the casual turtle people, the people who they dip their toes in because they were making some money. Um, they were laughing at me when I was talking turtles before. Um, and then when this whole thing happened, when Jenica was punchline and everybody was going crazy, um, then suddenly everybody was getting in the turtle game. And now people have kind of gone back home. But you know what I, I, I've noticed that I don't think the community is talking about. And this is what the problem sometimes that I have with top 10 lists, something that you and I have an experience with in the past, but not something we do presently. Not to say that we won't do it again in the future, but um, I think that sometimes things get uh, kind of lost in the shuffle. And one that I feel like has been totally lost in the shuffle, everybody was ready to comment when it was going down, including us, right? We had it on the cold list when we did hot and cold. We've had it on the down portion of three up, three down, talking about Jenica Turtle. That book we talked about, I remember Mike Morello talking about that book going down to like 20 to $25 and talking about how little demand there was for that book. That is a 50 to $55 book today. An IDW book, less than a year old, um, less than I think six months old at this point, um, selling for $55. That has, you look at the cycle, right? It's already hit its peak, it's come down, and then it's risen back up. It's got staying power. So that makes me sit there and go, well, what about people who get introduced? What happens when they make that toy? And new people get introduced to Jenica. They are going to want these items, and these items are not going to be cheap. I don't think that first appearance is going back down. As long as Jenica exists in the book, as long as she exists as the fifth member, I think that first appearance can only go up. Yeah, yeah Especially if they got toys coming out. Yeah, that's, and that's what, that's the missing piece. Um, and there's so much I would love to say about that that I really shouldn't, but it just, it's one of those things where that is going to happen eventually. And when it does, um, I really think that that changes the game. It's just that the process for doing those toys isn't the same as the comics. It's, it's all complicated licensing stuff because you're dealing with Nickelodeon. Um, if they do a cartoon and Jenica is featuring a cartoon and you start introducing children in mass, to this character if you start for back to school when they come out with those book bags if they have girl ones with jenica on it i know my daughters are gonna want them all you would need is a, a turtle shell backpack with the, <laughs> the yellow right and they already do them if they just start including jenica in that product mix if she starts getting that kind of attention um if the next turtles live action movie they decide to go with the five instead of the four. Uh, any of these things happen, if all of these things happen, this character can do nothing but go up. Um, sure, is it possible that Jenna could go away? Uh, sure, she could. That's always gonna be something that's gonna scare people. Um, but what I'm talking about is this one shot. I think this one shot is going to be, uh, or this mini series, because it's the, typically the micro series, they're like one to four issues. I think that they're going to be um, they're going to be overlooked this week because of punchline, other weeks because it's issue two, three, and four. Um, and I think that in the long term, that first appearance is going to be expensive. It's going to be outpriced a lot of people. Getting that book with that Jenica trade dress, which by the way, as a marketer, I have to say shout out to whoever. And I should, you know, what I should have looked up who this person is, but shout out to whoever the letterer is or whoever did the marketing 
for the book who came out with the trade dress for this book. Trade dress is phenomenal. This is one of the books where if I was creating a store exclusive, I actually would want to keep that trade dress on rather than do a virgin cover. And I have to say, shout out to the stores who did uh, store exclusives for this because I saw a cool like Mortal Kombat looking video game cover. I saw a cool um, Kingpin homage where you had Jenica as a human and Jenica as a turtle. A lot of unique stuff. Um, this is one to keep an eye out for. I know it's not one everybody's talking about today, but I, I'm willing to bet a lot of people are not aware that Jenica's values are rising. And for that reason, and all of the reasons that we have consistently talked about, about the value of this character, I really think that this is a solid long-term play. I would be grabbing those incentives if you can get them at or below ratios, specifically below. And I would even look at cover A if you can find it at the right play, price. Um, and I would be patient because you may see it on some discount lists. So yeah, I've picked this up. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I've kind of fallen off reading Ninja Turtles. I still pick them up, but I haven't been keeping up with the story since about issue 101. But there is Jenica Ferber out there. I tend to like the Jenica character. I will fully admit, though, I've like sporadically read Ninja Turtles over the past few years. And then, of course, with that Jenica hype, it's like, well, let me see what anyone's talking about. So I went back and started reading it again. But I agree with everything that you just said as far as it. I think as soon as there's Jenica toys out there and you got people picking up those toys, it's going to drive more people to the comic books. Now, I agree. I think that first appearance will always be the one to own. But just like other books, when you can't get that first appearance, that number one with that title on it sometimes becomes something that people want to pick up. Not just completionists, but people also new to the hobby don't might not realize, oh, 95 was the issue to get. They just saw Jenica number one and they think that's the one they want to buy. Well, and also think about Wolverine number one and the popularity that it's seen uh, since Wolverine's come back and, and, and being printed again by Marvel Comics. So many people can't afford a Hulk 180. So they, they're going for that Wolverine number one. Um, so it's one of those. Thor 126. You know, so, uh, so it's one of those things where um, we, see that, we see that often. Uh, another one that comes to mind is Moon Knight, where we're seeing that Moon Knight, Bill Sienkiewicz number one uh, rise in value. We've seen it with Blade. Uh, so I think that this is one of those scenarios. If this book becomes what I think it can, uh, you know, a three-digit book all day uh even then very well we could end up seeing this and by the way the second print be on the lookout for that ben bishop second print because that's still a seven to ten dollar book um and i think eventually that book dries up also don't forget pre-orders are currently open to the end of march for those limited release t-shirts we have that bolo club as well as that haunted and attorney shirt you can get those right now at simplemanscomics.com forward slash swag yeah, shout out to those who have put those orders in already. We appreciate all of your support for the channel. Um, and anybody out there who's thinking about uh, picking up a uh, shirt, again, we greatly appreciate everybody's support. But again, they're only going to be offered for a limited time, so do not sleep on this one. With that being said, this is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.